to John at Ephesus. Four different Gospels, four different localities. Eventually, they were collected together. Those who were reading Mark's Gospel would have this sort of doubt, at least initially, in their own minds, and perhaps a lingering doubt. What was Matthew and Luke to do for their communities? They were each going to write a Gospel, and what they in each in their own way do is to eliminate that part of the narrative which says that Pilate was amazed that Jesus died so soon. The reason for this? Raymond Brown, one of the premier scholars uh, in recent times on the New Testament, in his two-volume work, The Death of the Messiah, says that Matthew and Luke each have omitted mention of the doubt of Pilate because they did not want readers of their Gospels to have the same doubt. But now you see what the Gospels are doing. The Gospels are written not as straightforward histories of uh, what occurred, but as apologetic treatises to defend a particular belief. And that's not by itself bad. Uh, but the fact that they're writing in this way means that when we read them, we have to, in a way, read behind the text and ask what was really happening in order for these apologists to write about it in this way. We know now what they're trying to accomplish, and we are trying to decipher what the facts were that they're reporting about. So now, there is some lingering doubt in some circles as to whether Jesus actually died. And the later the gospel, uh, we, we see that the more firm they want to make the case that Jesus died. John is the last of the four gospels to be written. What does John do? John has it that... A Roman soldier there at the scene thrust a spear into the side of Jesus and immediately came out blood and water. John wants to prove a number of things, but for our purposes here, it appears that he wants to prove fully and finally that there is something that killed Jesus. Without the spear thrust, Raymond Brown asks in his two-volume work, uh, we must wonder what was the physiological cause of Jesus' death because crucifixion pierces no vital organ. Of course, Raymond Brown and many biblical scholars now do not accept the spear thrust given in John's Gospel to be a historical reality. They think that John introduced that spear thrust for his own theological purposes, including his apologetic reason of proving the death of Jesus. There's another reason, I believe, for thinking the spare thrust to, to be unhistorical. At least, it does not coincide with the reports in the other three Gospels. Imagine the scene. From, three uh, sorry, from 12 o'clock to 3 o'clock, for three hours straight, there is darkness over the whole land. Everybody can observe this. People are now confessing their faith in Jesus. People are beating their breasts and leaving the scene because they have crucified Jesus unjustly. Who would want to spare Jesus after this time? And it is precisely after this time that John's Gospel has it that the, one of the soldiers thrusts a spear into the side of Jesus. It would have to be some soldier who didn't notice the three hours of darkness, or at least is not scared by it, who didn't notice this massive earthquake that caused uh, such a rupture that uh, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. In short, this spear thrust is not historical, and in that case, we have nothing in the Gospels that would verify that Jesus fully and finally died. He may have appeared dead, the Gospel according to John says that uh, Jesus tasted the wine and then he uh, said it is finished and he bowed his head. The Gospel according to Mark says that Jesus expired and it, it, uh, precisely that term he used which is an ambiguous term. It is certain that Mark's Gospel wants to proclaim that Jesus died but there are clues along the way showing that the reality was different than the intended uh, proclamation. So finally we can see that there is some doubt as to whether Jesus really appeared alive to his disciples after he was once crucified. And second, even if he were crucified, that is, and second, uh, there is some uh, doubt as to whether Jesus actually died on the cross. The idea that Jesus died on the cross and raised, I was raised again from the dead, is not, and has not always been, a universal Christian belief, at least for the second part, the idea that Jesus was resurrected from the dead. As for the second part, that Jesus was resurrected from the dead, many scholars now look back to a, a gospel which they entitle 
a gospel cue because they do not know the name of this gospel. Think back to what David had presented to us about the priority of Mark. So you have Mark as a gospel, and you have two other gospels, Matthew and Luke, copying from Mark. So Mark is the source for these two other gospels. But these two other gospels are not only copying from Mark, there are some 200 and some verses that are common to Matthew and Luke, which are not found in Mark. Scholars believe that those verses represented in the two gospels are so similar to each other uh, linguistically that they must have been due to another source, which we do not have today, and which can only be reconstructed by looking at the way the verses are represented in these two Gospels. So it's a hypothetical document to make sense of the fact that Matthew and Luke are so similar to each other in more than 200 verses. It seems that they both copied from another source. Scholars call it Q, from the German Quelle, which means source. We don't know the name of it. Now that source document, according to biblical scholars such as John Kloppenburg, who's a premier scholar in the field of Q studies in the world, but he's from the University of Toronto, <coughs> posits in his book Q, the earliest gospel, that uh, the, the way in which the sign of Jonah was spoken about in the Q gospel before it came to be represented in Matthew and Luke actually seems to indicate that Jesus was assumed into heaven rather than uh, resurrected from the dead and then raised into heaven. So I must explain the two terms very quickly. I only I have less than five minutes. Resurrection, you've already heard about. Jesus dies, he's put in a tomb, uh, they, he comes out of the tomb somehow, nobody witnesses that, but he appears alive to his disciples again after he was once dead, and then eventually he's taken up into heaven. That's a resurrection. He comes back from the dead and appears to his disciples. Assumption is like translation. Wherever, from wherever he is, whether alive or dead, he's taken up into heaven. Remember Enoch and Elijah. Enoch walks with God, and then he's no more because God took him. That's assumption. Uh, not meaning that the way we make an assumption about facts, but this is the, the idea that God assumed him into heaven or translated him into heaven. This has become a Christian term, assumption. Elijah, caught up in a whirlwind, alive, taken up into heaven. And it is believed that Elijah will eventually come back. That is assumption. He's taken up, assumed, translated into heaven. According to John Kloppenberg, the Q gospel, speaking about the sign of Jonah, represents the occasion as that of assumption, which means that assuming Jesus died on the cross, he's put in the tomb, and then he's taken up directly from the tomb. That is why, of course, his body could not be found, according to Mark's gospel. This is a typical assumption story. The hero dies, and uh, he is put in a, uh, somewhere, and there's a search for his body, and his body cannot be found. Typical story from the Greco-Roman world in the time when these Gospels were written. So we're dealing here with assumption. That would mean that the, uh, re the, the reports saying that Jesus came out of the tomb and then appeared to his disciples are not historical reports. It would mean that we have a serious difficulty with Matthew, Mark, not so much with Mark, uh, but with uh, Luke and Matthew, Luke and, and John. Not so much with Mark, because Mark does not have that, uh, that uh, uh, narrative. But Mark does give a promise that Jesus will appear. Some angels appear to the women at the tomb and say to them, tell the disciples to go to Galilee, that is where they will see Jesus as he told them. This is in Mark chapter 16 verse 7. And the prelude to this is in Mark chapter 14 verse 28, where apparently Jesus had already told them some such thing while he was alive and walking the earth. But uh, scholars, uh, uh, many scholars, such as uh, Wolfhard Panningberg, a, a German scholar, uh, dispute that this is an original part of the story. They think that Mark himself was relying on a source that did not contain this narrative about Jesus appearing to his disciples. And Mark, using his source, has appended this idea that Jesus will appear to his disciples. Which means that even prior to Mark, there was an early Christian idea that Jesus was assumed into heaven from his tomb. And it is the later Gospels that try to color the narrative such as to make it that Jesus later appeared to his disciples. I believe this is a significant discovery because we have a corroboration both from Mark's uh, source and also from the Q source that some early Christians had this belief. I believe that this uh, discovery 
uh, can bring Muslims and Christians close in communication with each other because there are many Christians today who do not believe that Jesus actually resurrected from the dead and they would be inclined to think that Jesus was assumed into heaven. Some will say that he died first and then was assumed into heaven, but Dieter Zeller, a German scholar, and I close with this, is actually of the belief uh, that, as he has expounded in some of his writings, that uh, the Q gospel in depicting the sign of Jonah was actually speaking of Jesus being saved and rescued alive and protected from danger, just as Jonah was alive in the belly of, of the whale. And it is Matthew's particular coloring that makes us think uh, about the three days and three nights. It wasn't about three days and three nights in the Q source. It was about Jesus being rescued alive and saved the way Je Jonah was alive in the belly of the whale. So I leave you at that. We'll come back and deal with uh, the rebuttals. But I'll be very interested to hear uh, David's responses to some of the things I have just said. Thank you very much. Thank you for that, Shabir. I'd like to have the first response from uh, David Seckham, and he's agreed to have a response for 15 minutes, and then subsequently we'll have the second response from Shabir Ali, and thereafter we'll open the floor to question and answers. So, even they call David Seckham. Thank you. Uh, 